I'd like to tell you a little story about the F word. When I was young, I was just about the shyest kid you could ever imagine, and those who knew me back then can confirm this. At home, though, I was bossy and liked to argue. My parents, who of course only wanted me to succeed, suggested I tone down the bossiness and argumentativeness because they thought it wouldn't get me very far, seeing I was a girl. Perhaps if I had been a boy, my bossiness may have been framed as leadership and my argumentativeness as a healthy love of debate. I didn't get this message only from my parents, who of course only wanted me to succeed. I got this message from school, from peers, from magazines, from TV. It all made me quietly mad. I mean, why couldn't I both be a girl and have strong opinions and want to talk about them? I quietly decided I was a feminist before I knew such a thing even existed. Feminism, the F word that seems to make us uncomfortable. So what's feminism anyway? We know it means different things to different people. For me, it's about moving to equity. It's about giving people what they need, about leveling the playing field, about bringing multiple and diverse perspectives to the table. But talking about feminism is hard. It's hard to ask people to acknowledge that there might be imbalances in our systems, in the way that we choose people. The most common response I often hear when talking about feminism is, "Well, we just want the best people. We just want the best people." And I think the people who say this, who say we just want the best people, really mean it. They do really just want the best people. Things like inclusion policies or Frances McDormand's Oscar call for inclusion writers in Hollywood seem to make us uncomfortable. Surely our systems are working. I mean, surely we're getting the best people in our hiring efforts, in the authors of the books we read, in the movies we watch, in our investments. But how do we know we're getting the best people? How can we trust but verify? Because what if we aren't always getting the best people? If we don't need inclusion policies or inclusion riders, then why does only 4% of venture capital investment go to women? How come only 4%? How come two, only two countries in the entire world have 50% or more representation by women, and that's from United Nations Women? How come only 20% of company board seats in Canada are held by women? And even closer to home, here in New Brunswick, how come only 16% of elected officials at the provincial level happen to be women? If we truly just want the best people, what makes the stats so skewed? Let's take a look at orchestras, and we'll soon have an awesome one here tonight. In the 1970s, the top five orchestras in the United States had only 5% women, but by the mid-1990s, they were up to 25%, or had increased the number of women by five times. So what happened? Actually, it's pretty simple. They they just started using blind auditions. So this allowed people to ask themselves, maybe their bias might be in the way, getting in the way of getting the best people. So it allowed them to test this, and musicians were able to audition on the basis of their technical skill. So they found a workaround for their bias. But what about places where we can't do blind auditions? What about when we're electing people or when we're pitching for business investment? How do we get judged on the basis of our merit? our competence, our track record, our projected results? How do we level the playing field so that business founders who also happen to be women don't have to make up a male co-founder? How do we get to 10% of venture capital investment going to women from the 4% today? And then, how do we get to 50%? One of my favorite podcasters happens to be a man. His name is Tim Ferriss, and if you haven't heard of him, that, he's great. <laughs> If you haven't heard of him, I suggest you check him out. He produces absolutely excellent content. He's also published a number of wildly successful books, and last year he published two books profiling stories and advice from an array of successful people. The first was called Tools of Titans and gave us 106 stories from world-class performers. But is Tim Ferriss featuring the best people? Out of the 106 people he spoke to in Tools of Titans, only 14 of them happen to be women. That's 13%. Later in 
Later last year, he released Tribe of Mentors, short life advice from the best in the world, where out of the 133 people he spoke with, 41 of them happened to be women. That's 13, or sorry, not 13, opposite number, 31%, or more than double the previous book. While I don't know what caused the change, I think that this change in stats in two different books published in the same year is remarkable. However he ended up doing it, he managed to more than double the number of women featured in his second book, all in the span of a year. Tim Ferriss was unconsciously amplifying the stories of top performers as men. Does it matter? I think it does. I think it matters because he wasn't saying that he was sharing the stories of top performing men. He said top performers or the best people. The way that we define these things matters, and he's demonstrated that stats can change, and they can change really fast. I think it's important for me to say here that I honestly don't think he had done this on purpose. I think it was a blind spot, an unknown bias. And I'd like to contend that we all have bias. I have bias, and you have bias. For instance, for me, out of the six books I've happened to have read this year, they all happen to be by male authors, and I hadn't even realized this until I took a look at my own stats. So am I reading the best people? Even here, I'm focused exclusively on one thing, which is gender. And we know that gender isn't the only bias out there. There's things like economic status, skin color, religion, sexual orientation, ability. None of these exist in a vacuum. The science helps us to try to understand how each of these biases might affect us. In a very recent study, people were asked to evaluate resumes for a lab manager position. And the only difference in the submitted resume was the name. The name was either John or Jennifer. Jennifer was rated as less competent and on average recommended to be paid 13% less than John, all with the exact same resume. So, I don't know about you, but I don't want the chance of my success to be dependent on whether my name is Vanessa or Victor. I want it to be dependent on my merit, on whether I'm the best person for the job or the task at hand. Looking closely at imbalances in our system, and particularly gender imbalance, really came to light last fall with the start of the Me Too and the Time's Up movement. For almost everyone in the room, you're probably having one of three reactions. What's that? A sense of solidarity, which is where I sit. Or maybe it makes you a little uncomfortable. None of those are right or wrong, but it does potentially give you some information about where you identify and where your bias might be. I think the Me Too and Time's Up movements are important right now because we've been having the same conversation that we've been having for decades, that we just want the best people and that our systems are designed to get us the best people. But all of a sudden, social media has allowed many more people to have a voice that didn't have one before, and a much louder voice. And we've realized that maybe our systems aren't actually designed to get us the best people. Maybe some of our systems are designed to just reinforce what's already there. As the Me Too movement really started getting fired up in the fall, I couldn't stop thinking about it, about the fact that it was a thing. But the fact that most of the women I knew had some sort of uniquely personal story about it. It got me to thinking about, what could I do? And at first I thought, well, probably nothing. I mean, it's too big and complex of an issue. What could I possibly do? But this thought wouldn't go away. And so one afternoon, I sat down and scribbled the names of 60 women I knew or knew of in Atlantic Canada that I thought were totally kicking butt. And I figured, if I knew this many, it could surely only be the tip of the iceberg. And when I realized, I could help amplify their stories. And so I started a site called Amplify East, and our tagline is inspiring women in Atlantic Canada, not a supply problem. If there isn't a supply problem, then why do we still have stats like only 16% of elected officials here in New Brunswick being women? If it's not a supply problem, Maybe it's a mindset problem. Maybe, there, maybe there's more we can all do to look at our bias and the bias in our systems. And so I leave you with the question of, what stories are you amplifying? 
Where's your bias? As I continue to try to remember to ask myself, where's my bias? And maybe one day, one of you will be telling us the story of how we got there, of how we got the best people, regardless of what they look like. Thank you.